Hello and welcome to the Smart Recovery Podcast, your audio headquarters for inspiring and insightful discussions on the topic of addiction recovery. What you'll hear with us will be self-empowering, science-based, and stigma-free. We believe you have the power within yourself to make changes that will move you toward a more satisfying life. And we hope these messages and interviews with leading addiction experts and advocates will help you believe that too. Remember that the purpose of this podcast is to educate and inform. It is not a substitute for medical care from a doctor or other qualified medical professionals. Before making any changes in your treatment plan, please discuss your thoughts with your medical provider. Welcome to the Smart Recovery Podcast. I'm Luke Frazier, your host. Today, we have a very special guest. He's Dr. Reed Hester. He's a psychologist and a researcher. He has a doctorate in uh, psychology from Washington State University. And I believe your undergraduate degree is from University of Washington. How, how does that work, Reed? Uh, aren't they arch rivals? Well, yes. And, and when there's the Apple Day uh, Bowl, where the, the WSU plays UW in the football game, just before Thanksgiving, I always win. Okay, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's called playing both sides of the fence. I like that. Um, well, and actually, one reason I went there is because um, I was a poor student at the time. And... Uh, so I had in-state tuition in both places. Okay, that's good. Because back that's... then, it made a huge difference. Yeah, actually, absolutely. Um, so yes, I am glad you're on the podcast. Thanks for being here. Mm-hmm. Um, I would like you to start, Reed, just with uh, a little bit more about your personal and professional background. We've heard about your education, but uh, what else? What was your journey like from uh, from in, into the position you are now? Gosh. Um... That goes way back, um, actually, to my undergraduate years. Um, right after I graduated uh, from the University of Washington, I, I took a year off. And, and uh, in that winter of 1974, um, I ran into Alan Marlatt, uh, who at the time was, had just come down from the University of British Columbia um, to Seattle. Uh, and he was looking for help running experiments. And so I agreed to be a confederate in an experiment on uh, heavy drinking in college students and the influence of other people's drinking on, on the subjects drinking. And that led to a, a sequence of, of um, uh, recommendations of when I started to graduate school. Uh, Alan said, we gotta look up Warren Garlington. He's a, he's a you know, well-known figure in, in alcohol problems at WSU. And so I met him and, and we worked together. I was a pre-doc fellow of his and when I, got an internship uh, in Albuquerque at the VA where I was, I was in Albuquerque for 35 years. Um, uh, Warren said, we ought to meet, uh, you ought to run into Bill Miller. He's a rising star down there. This is like 1978, 79, mm-hmm. 78. And so I met up with him and he and I developed a collaborative working relationship that lasted decades until he retired a few years ago. Um, you may know him from motivational interviewing, mm-hmm. uh, and evidence-based protocols. Uh, which are a big stuff. part of uh, smart recovery, as you know. Pardon me? Which are a big part of smart recovery, as you know, the motivational interviewing. Oh, yes, yes. Um, and that's in no small part um, uh, because of Tom Horvath, who was one of the, origi- one of the original presidents of smart recovery, um, and his, his focus on empirically supported protocols and their translation and adaptation into mutual support groups. And that's how I met, uh, that's how I got involved with with Smart Recovery was through Tom Horvath. Mm -hmm. He and I met at at an addiction conference, gosh, probably, well, more than 40 years ago. Um, And we just hit it off because we're kindred spirits. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, so that's how, uh, I think it it was now actually 20 years ago that he asked me to be on the board of professional advisors uh, and I agreed to it. Um, I, and um, I subsequently got involved with developing a, a, um, an abstinence focused protocol for people with alcohol and drug problems, which we did in collaboration with smart recovery. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I went to the national meeting, gosh, I think it was 2010 or 2011 and presented uh, the, the, the uh, protocol and, and what we were hoping to do in terms of recruiting people. And the audience there was just so enthusiastic and so upbeat and welcoming and eager to collaborate. Um, and uh, so that kind of launched my, my working relationship with Smart Recovery. 
Um, I subsequently went back to another meeting and gave them the results of the clinical trial. And we published that in, in two papers in Journal of Medical, Medical Internet Research. Mm. Uh, so I, didn't that know that, I didn't know there was such a thing. Just It focuses on just internet research? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let's, well um, dig read, digital let me... therapeutic. Digital therapeutics, I should oh, say. Oh, good. Well, we'll certainly get into that. It's a fascinating topic. But let me uh, pause here for a second and say that, really, um, Reed, it seems like you just had a very um, strong indication of the kinds of things you wanted to do and the people that you were associated with um, on through your career. Is that is that accurate? Well, yes, but it's also been somewhat fortuitous. Um, you know, uh, never discount the... Uh, uh, the importance and the value of, um, of uh, opportunities coming your way and latching onto them. Um, and that's how I got interested in psychology in the first place. Before that, I was an English literature major um, and uh, ended up uh, getting a, um, a degree with distinction in psychology as an undergraduate, and that's what led to graduate school. And that's what led to my internship and meeting Bill Miller, and that's what led to um, a lot of writing collaborations and research. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so I've just kind of followed my, my enthusiasm and my interest. Uh, and fortunately, I've been able to find, you know, uh, funding and support to do this low these yeah. many years. Well, that's excellent. It is very encouraging. I think that some people feel like uh, if they're meandering or they don't know exactly where they're headed. But I think what you're saying is to, you know, keep uh, pay attention, keep your eyes open um, and and be a part of, you know, the flow almost. I mean, it sounds like it was a uh, a matter of flowing into the right people, the right places, um, and that's a great thing. Yeah, and, and also putting effort into the process of, of uh, collaborating with and working with others. Um, you know, um, I had great mentors uh, and I've had, had great colleagues working with me. You know, the, the work that we've done over the years has really been a team effort. It's not just me uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and my current um, uh, science director, he's direct project director and clinical psychologist, Dr. William Campbell, uh, has been working with me for 13 years now. Um, and uh, he was with me when I founded this company, Checkup and Choices, mm -hmm. uh, to better disseminate uh, the protocols and to put them all together into a single package. Right. That is now Checkup and Choices. Yeah, and that's something I really want to dive into a little bit. Um, in the meantime, you're listening to the Smart Recovery Podcast. Today's guest is Dr. Reed Hester. As he mentioned, he's the uh, president, I believe, if that's the right title, of Checkup and Choices, one of the founders. He's also a psychologist and a researcher in the area of substance abuse. Um, Reed, Actually, then let's... I'm the head of the research division. Head of the research division. Yeah, okay, so did I, did I promote you uh, inadvertently? Did I promote you, uh, Reed? <laughs> no, I don't want that position. <laughs> okay, <laughs> very good. Um, so, listen, let's let's uh, head in that direction about the current pandemic, and it's certainly affecting recovery in all sorts of ways. Um, I know that checkup and choices and other digital interventions are becoming more and more important. Uh, what, what would you say, or how, in general, is the current pandemic affecting recovery? Well, um, you know, the, the bad news is that it is, um, it is leading to a significant increase in binge drinking, and particularly in women. Um, that article in JAMA just came out uh, a couple weeks ago. 41% increase uh, in binge drinking episodes in women this wow. year. Wow. Yeah. yeah, just this year. Um, I put a link to it on my Facebook page at Checkup and Choices. Uh, if you want to like that, you know, you can, you can dig mm -hmm. down and find it. Um, but, uh, and, and there's, there's increase in men, but it's not as nearly as significant as in women. Um, and fortunately, um, on, on the positive side, uh, women seem to um, be attracted to and, uh, um, and use our, our digital tools. Um, and in our clinical trials, 60% of, uh, of our study participants have been women. And that has held true uh, since the early 2000s in all of our clinical trials. So d does that mean women have been early adopters of some of these digital tools, and including the ones that, uh, that you've developed? Well, you know, it's hard to say um, because 
uh, we've structured these as standalone self-guided uh, interventions. Uh, so uh, unless someone contacts me with a question or uh, a comment or a suggestion, um, uh, we, don't, we don't routinely um, interact with, with our subscribers. Uh, we, we value their privacy and their confidentiality and we don't want them to be uh, receiving emails you know, from us um, without their permission. You know, we do have a guided email program within the protocol uh, that sends out an email once a week, you know, helping them through the program, but that's something that they have to sign up for. Mm. And they can also create custom text messages and custom emails, uh, but they have to, they have to initiate that. Mm -hmm. um, and then the program continues on with that. Right. And it certainly is the case, however, that, you know, part of that anonymity is probably important, but just the fact that it's digital and can be accessed. I mean, is that, is that a reason that, um, uh, that, that because of the pandemic, it's uh, recovery tools have had to broaden in this way? Well, um, I, I'm not sure that they've had to broaden as much as they've been here. Um, I mean, our first uh, web application went online in 2002. Um, but it's just that people are, are paying more attention to it because you know, what used to be face-to-face -face has gone to Zoom meetings. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, to be honest, they are not as, um, they are not as helpful, they're not as impactful as face-to-face -face meetings. Um, and uh, I, I have no doubt that uh, they're just not as, as useful. Um, I mean, I'd rather walk down the hall and talk to my programmers um, rather than have a Zoom meeting with them. Mm -hmm. And, um, so, I think that's very yeah. true. That's that's the human interaction you're talking about, Reed, and right. that worries me a little bit because of this, uh, you know, more meetings on uh, Zoom, more interactions. I mean, can there be the necessary connection to other people through these tools? Now, obviously, you're an advocate because you've been working in the field with these tools. Well, it, it, we have the evidence that it's effective, uh, but in our clinical trial of what was then overcoming addictions, which is now the abstinence protocol in Checkup and Choices, uh, we found that combining uh, um, using the resources of Smart Recovery along with the web application that we developed um, yielded the best outcomes. Uh, but that's, that being said, people who did not go to meetings um, but just used our web application, which is something that they did on their own, uh, we did. We initially had actually tried to recruit people to do that, and, and most people said, "No, I'm not going to do that. Mm. I refuse to be, you know, uh, to, to not be allowed to to attend meetings." But it ended up that there was a, a small minority of people who didn't go to meetings and just used our web application, um, and they had uh, they had slightly more um, anxiety and mood disorder issues than those who attended group meetings, uh, but uh, and their the recovery, their, their reduced drinking and their reduced alcohol related problems was pretty similar to those who did, but still the trend was for the people who went to meetings and, and uh, used the resources of smart recovery as well as our protocol to have the best outcomes. Right, so a combination. And that's what we have always recommended. It's not an either or. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that when we, um, at the exit interview at 12 months, when we asked people, you know, what resources did you use uh, to help yourself? They mentioned us. They mentioned uh, smart recovery meetings. They mentioned their pastors and ministers. Uh, they men mentioned their family members. Um, so people are using, and therapists, people are using a wide variety of, of tools to, um, to address their issues and concerns, uh, which I think is, is, is great. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we talk about these multiple pathways of recovery, and that's not just, uh, you know, 12 step versus smart versus uh, life ring. It's also the other things you include with your recovery, as you said, pastors, uh, therapists, maybe other other members of a support group. So it does all work together. But I'm really um, curious more about, again, those folks who kind of said that they only use the web app. Um, what else did you find out about them and how they were successful? Well, um, I mean, there wasn't any difference between that group and uh, 
the group that used the uh, smart recovery in terms of the use of other resources. Okay. Uh, but they were more anxious. They didn't. They were more slightly more anxious and slightly more depressed. Um, excuse me. Uh, at the beginning, um, and um, so that's really all I can say about about mm -hmm. that group. Okay. Um, but it's uh, you know we found uh, we have consistently advocated for people to. Um, use all the resources available to sure, them. Sure, sure. The advantages are clear for that, but there's certainly uh, good recovery, um, probably uh, or primarily through a web app. I mean, I don't mean primarily, I just mean as a strong element of a person's recovery. Is yes. that true? Yes, mm -hmm. yes it is. I mean, You're that's what the data says. Pardon me? That's, that, that's what our outcome data says. And Very and good. Trust everybody else has got to show their data. That's right, and that's important too because anecdotes are just anecdotes and data is data, so um, that's very important. Uh, you're listening to the Smart Recovery Podcast. Our guest is Dr. Reed Hester. We're talking about web-based applications in recovery. We're talking about digital interventions and some of the research and the results of the research. Um, what are some of the challenges, Reed, about using effective, uh, the effective use of web-based tools? You know, I'd say the primary uh, challenge for, uh, for subscribers and for us as providers uh, is engagement, is continued engagement. Um, and uh, we do have uh, some indication that uh, the more people engage with our application, uh, the better their outcomes. Um, but that's not always the case. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes people, uh, you know, go through our protocol and they get it. They, they, they figured out, this is what I need to do to get better. Um, and, uh, and thank you very much, I'm out of here. And okay. we're fine with that. <laughs> sure, that's the positive result. Yeah, and others, you know, uh, log in and work and work and work at it and still do not have good outcomes. I mean, we're not a, a cure for everybody, that's for sure. Um, but um, we're, we're one path. Uh, amongst many that people can take, and we encourage people to take as many different, uh, use as many different resources um, as they can, uh, whether that's medication, uh, psychotherapy, counseling, uh, mutual support meetings, um, family members, uh, friends, social support networks, uh, you know, you name it. Mm -hmm. um, if that's what works for you, that, that's that's what we're most concerned about. That's what we That's right. do it. Especially as uh, we started out talking about this pandemic and how it's really, uh, you know, having a negative impact, especially as you said, among women binge drinkers. But also I know that the opioid overdose deaths have increased during the pandemic and other kinds of things. I, I guess there was also some data about just alcohol sales during uh, the pandemic, which you know oh, you can yeah. associate with. Now, there's may not be causation, but you can certainly associate that with potential abuse. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, the uh, the data on sales, uh, both in the United States as well as worldwide, uh, is just startling. Um, and but both in-person sales as well as um, online sales of alcohol. Mm -hmm. Oh, and the in-person, I mean, I don't know about, you're located in California right now, in Ohio, there's been problems with uh, in-person drinking, you know, bars that stay open late. And one of the things that the, uh, that the state has done is uh, set the curfews earlier for the bars and when they can sell alcohol. Um, so there's all kinds of strategies they're trying to, uh, you know, intervene with uh, the spread of the coronavirus. But that's an entirely other uh, other program, Reed. Um, let me but, get but back. It is true, it is true mm -hmm. that, um, you know, I mean, if you read the science, the JAMA articles, the CDC uh, uh, papers, it is true that um, being in, in enclosed spaces in close proximity to other people who are uh, talking at you often loud um, and not wearing masks uh, is, is a recipe for um, a super spreader event. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And um, there's just kind of no getting around that. Um, right. uh, and the involvement of alcohol, the involvement of alcohol in those settings is certainly why people may be talking louder or there may be loud music or there's less use of masks. So certainly that is, uh, as you say, that's been pretty well documented. 
Um, well, and the more people you have in a room talking, the louder it gets. True. That's true. Even if there's no music going on. Mm -hmm. You know, you put 20 people in a room and it's going to be louder than if there's three people in the room. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's go back for a moment to the checkup and choices protocols. Sure. Um, can you make a um, just kind of a uh, simple pathway that people would have once they discover the digital app and, and then how they use it and, and what eventually can happen? Yeah. Well, um, we, uh, we offer people uh, who come to our application from Smart Recovery, uh, and we have a special tunnel for them uh, uh, to take our screener, uh, which is a well valid and internationally validated screening protocol, and then our checkup if they're ambivalent about whether or not to change. But not everybody is. Um, and so if you're ambivalent about whether to not to change or how you should go about doing that, uh, we recommend the checkup. If, you're, uh, if you've made the decision that I need to change my drinking now, uh, I don't need to you know, be further motivated, uh, then you just can go straight into the abstinence protocols that we've developed. Um, and we have one for alcohol, which is what we've evaluated in a randomized clinical trial. But we also have others for uh, stimulants, opioids, um, and, um, compulsive, and marijuana and compulsive gambling. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, we have not had the opportunity because we haven't had the funding to evaluate these, these parallel protocols. Our funding comes from, uh, from NIH and NIAAA, uh, and it, um, the, source is, the source, the name of the funding is Small Business Innovative Research Grants. Well, so you have to keep innovating. You can't just kind of do <laughs> a slight iteration. You know, well, we did this one for alcohol. We want to do this one for marijuana. They say, that's not very innovative. You already demonstrated it works for alcohol. You okay. Know? So, um, and we're still looking for, for resources uh, to, uh, to help us uh, actually uh, to complete the development of a marijuana checkup and then evaluate it in a clinical trial. Now, could it also then extend to other kinds of behaviors besides substance use disorder? Uh, any plans to innovate in that direction for you know, any harmful behaviors or, or internet addictions or self-harm, anything like that? I mean, you mentioned gambling, but anything else? Yeah, um, we don't. Um, even, even though the, the principles of behavior change and cognitive behavior change span the process of, of behaviors, or the, that are problematic and distressful to an individual. Um, we only have so much bandwidth. Um, and there's lots of other people who are working in mood disorders uh, and eating disorders um, and smoking. I mean, we never went into smoking because there's lots of good evidence-based protocols for smoking cessation. Um, Including so, di digital apps or web-based web apps in, in well, that no, area? Thinking more of the quit lines and the and the nicotine replacement products and those things, mm -hmm. uh, I know that people have been working on uh, nicotine uh, applications, but I haven't seen any data on that recently. Okay. And speaking of which, um, let me just uh, caution the listeners um, to be uh, when you when you look for applications to help you make changes, be skeptical. Carpe diem is the term. Okay. Because there are buckets and buckets of, of you know, self-change um, protocols and applications on the App Store and on the web. Um, and the vast, vast majority of them have absolutely no evidence of effectiveness. Mm -hmm. They put them up there saying, well, we think this works, you know. Um, and by the way, we don't want to charge you for it. Right. Um, right. And, and the, the number of protocols uh, that are empirically supported uh, and available to the general public are a handful. Mm -hmm. Well, that's exactly the, the one of the points of uh, smart recovery, you know, is the use of evidence based and uh, principles that are testable um, and, and conduct uh, re research is conducted. Um, and same with uh, checkup and choices. You're talking about empirical evidence and clinical trials. I think you said clinical trials. Is that, uh, right. is that true? Clinical trials, yes. and, um, and, you know, and that is where people can have some sense of uh, trust that if they use the tool correctly, they'll get results that are favorable. Yes, that's true. Mm -hmm. 
Um, what else with um, the future of these kind of web-based apps? Do you have any sense that are there competitors, if you will, to, uh, to check up in choices? Are there those that are currently doing research about their um, specific iteration of this kind of tool? Another group that is offering um, digital interventions for people with alcohol and drug problems is Chess Health. Um, and they're a healthcare organization back east. Um, and they're offering this to people who are in treatment for substance use disorders. Um, and Kathy Carroll and her colleagues uh, have developed these protocols over years. I, I know them well. Um, and uh, they have good evidence of effectiveness. Uh, so if a person is involved in, in a substance uh, use disorder treatment, um, certainly uh, CBT for CBT, which is the name of their program, is something that we would recommend that they consider. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's another uh, uh, protocol um, called, um, hang on a second here, Vorvida, Vor sorry, Vorvida, V-O-R-V-I-D-A. Uh, that's just come online in the last couple of weeks. And uh, it's a moderate drinking protocol uh, that, per, that has evidence of effectiveness from a randomized clinical trial in Germany. Mm. And they have applied for, and I think they're in the process of getting uh, FDA clearance for its use as a digital therapeutic under prescription. Um, so there are some other, yeah, other groups that are kind of are they kind of following in the footsteps of, uh, of, of your work and, and uh, other, other innovators, other uh, pioneers? Well, Borvita certainly is. Um, they're using a protocol that we've, we've had online for 20 years now almost. Um, Kathy Carroll took a different tact um, in focusing on the cognitive behavioral skills specifically and then developing a series of videos a short vignettes uh, that teach those skills and ask the people to, uh, you know, present questions. How would you respond to this? Um, that is much more uh, video based than ours. Very interactive from uh, from a visual point of view. Yes. Yes. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Reed, and, what else? Uh, uh, there's, those are the two primary uh, colleagues uh, that I'm aware of mm -hmm. uh, that have good evidence of effectiveness mm -hmm. uh, at people changing their drinking. Yeah. Reed, um, as we're starting to wrap up here, what, what would you hope for uh, for people who are, you know, addressing their, their substance use disorder, other kinds of things? H how would you hope to help them the most effectively? Are there, are there things that you're uh, working toward? Um, what, what encouragement, maybe let's put it that way, what encouragement do you have for folks? Sure. Well, uh, you know, there's, there's lots of hope of reasons to be hopeful and optimistic. I know that's hard to say in these days uh, with our current political climate and polarization and, uh, and the pandemic take, taking hold and its impact on people's ability to deal with their issues in recovery. But there is reason to be hopeful. And it lies in, in uh, finding uh, what is going to be helpful for you, using it and persisting. Changing a long-term habit, which is what an addiction is applied to a drug or alcohol. Uh, changing a long-term habit takes time. And it's easy for people, and I, us, I should say, I, myself included, it's easy for people to slip back into their old habits. Uh, it takes a good six months to a year uh, to really have a substantial change uh, in, in a person's, in a strong habit. Um, but with that persistence, people can be successful. Um, and if you're not being successful after three or four months with, with a, a plan A, try plan B. Mm. And plan B, if it isn't working after a couple of months, try plan C. And keep persisting until you find uh, what it is that works for you. That's excellent advice. Um, I think we'll leave it right there. I, I love ending on a hopeful note. And you certainly Absolutely. provided. You provided. Absolutely. And the other, the other hopeful thing real quickly is that, that when, when you make a change in your heavy drinking or your drug use, you affect not just yourself, but your family, your social environment, uh, your community. Uh, and so it's like dropping a pebble in a pool and seeing the waves ripple out. It's in a positive way. Now, we, we talk about these negative ripples from uh, a, an addiction, but 
Are you saying that once you change those habits, you're actually putting out positive ripples? Absolutely. Hmm. Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, and I have to say that um, the people who I, uh, one of the reasons I have, I love working with the people in Smart Recovery is because it is the most upbeat, positive, and forward-looking group of people in mutual health I've ever run across, period. Um, that's quite an endorsement, Reed. That's, uh, that's a very nice endorsement. Um, you know, uh, it, it's a wonderful group of, of volunteers, and the organization itself is really um, just, I, I can't say too much good about it. It's, it's, it's amazing. Um, and uh, all the work that the volunteers do is, is uh, you know, my hats are off to them. Great. Well, on behalf of Smart Recovery, I'll say thank you. <laughs> yeah, <I will. laughs> We've been talking with uh, Dr. Reed Hester. He's a researcher and a psychologist associated with the uh, organization Checkup and Choices, which you can find out more about. And we'll be putting links to that in our blog post and write up of this episode of the Smart Recovery podcast. Reed, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it was a pleasure. It was an honor to be able to come in and, and uh, talk with you and, and your listeners uh, about this. I mean, there's, there's, there are many reasons to be hopeful and upbeat. Thank you. And uh, so this is Luke Frazier, your host for the Smart Recovery Podcast. Until next time, stay healthy and stay connected. Thanks for listening to the Smart Recovery Podcast. If you found today's episode helpful and inspiring, we encourage you to share it with someone who might need to hear its messages. If you or someone you know needs addiction-related help, we encourage you to visit smartrecovery.org to find a wealth of digital resources, practical tools, and social supports meant to help you and your loved ones on their recovery journey. While there, you can search for a local smart meeting near you or join our online community to find 24-7 access to recovery help through regular online meetings and helpful message boards and forums. All of our meetings and online community resources are completely free of charge. Be sure to connect with us online to get more helpful addiction-related resources. Visit our website at smartrecovery.org where you can search for local meetings, join our online community, subscribe to our e-newsletter, and find regular blogs, videos, podcasts, and more. You can also help us to spread our self-empowering, science-based messages to more people who need to hear from them in important ways. First, get trained on the Smart Recovery Program. If you are a licensed healthcare provider and could benefit from using Smart Recovery in your professional work, or if you are someone who would like to volunteer and lead smart recovery meetings in your community, please check out our training and volunteer opportunities at www.smartrecovery.org training. Second, donate to support our work. Smart Recovery is a nonprofit that runs on the donations from generous supporters who understand the need for recovery-related support. If you would like to help us reach more people, consider donating to Smart Recovery at smartrecovery.org slash donate. We'd like to thank U.S. World Meds for their generous support of this episode. We'll see you next time on the next episode of the Smart Recovery Podcast.